Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The show is about to begin. There's no easy way of knowing which direction they are going. There's no knowing where they're rowing or which way the river's flowing. Is it raining? Is it snowing? Is a hurricane a blowing? <gasps> Not a speck of light is showing. The danger must be growing. Are the fires of hell a glowing? Is the grizzly reaper mowing? Yes, the danger must be growing. Cause the rowers keep on rowing. And they're certainly not showing any sign that they are slowing. Good evening, and welcome back to Three Guys in a Flick. This is where we review the good, the bad, and the absurd. Tonight's episode, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Beware, spoilers. Finally leaving the boiler room, we are back in my basement. Uh, my name is Don, and to my right is our comic book guy, John. Scrum delicious. And to my left, we have the professor, Ken. Hello, all. How you guys doing? I'm glad to have escaped the boiler room. Yeah, well, me too. That was pretty hairy there for a minute. What'd you guys think? Did you guys have fun with the Halloween thing? Yeah, that was a good time. Yeah, it was still. I'm looking forward to the sequel. Yeah, well, or, I... Or remake. <laughs> Fuck you. Uh, yeah, I don't... I wouldn't... I would care not to watch any remakes again for quite a long time. Uh, uh, present company movie included, so... We'll talk about that later. Uh, so, yeah, we're coming back to you after our Halloween special. We had a lot of fun. Uh, leave us some comments if you guys liked it, what you liked, what you didn't like. Uh, we'd love to hear from you anytime. Uh, so, yeah, now we're back, and we went back to the hat. Uh, you heard us pull the Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. This is John's food movie. Well, the great thing about this movie, too, is we're kind of easing back into things. You know, we were talking about horror movies, and we've moved into a serial killer. No. No, it's not a silly serial killer movie. Well, I think we're going to have to talk about that later. <laughs> uh, you, are you trying to piss the professor off so early? Uh, it's good to poke the tiger every once in a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you son of a bitch. So, John, why did you pick this 50-year-old movie? Well, the main reason I picked this is because the assignment was to pick a food movie. And by definition, a food movie, uh, just to sum it all up, is a movie where whatever food is being featured in the movie is essential to the movie. Like you couldn't have made this movie or the movie would not have worked if it didn't have that food source in it. So if you count candy, which is pretty much a food source, could you have made Willy Wonka without the candy? Sure. He could have been Willy Wonka and the PVC factory. Well, I feel like if it was Willy Wonka without the candy, he'd just be Jigsaw. <sighs> well, you think about it. He's luring in kids. Right, to because his trap. right, because when Ronald Dahl or what was the new who who wrote Willy Wonka? Ro uh, Roll Dahl? Roll Dahl. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, Roll Dahl. Okay, so if you're Roll Dahl, you write this book and you think to yourself, you know what, in thirty, twenty, forty years, however many later, I think they're gonna name a a serial killer after him, and it's Jigsaw. Well, let's think of it this way. A. Or did the writer of Jigsaw say, you know what? I think uh, Charlie is Jigsaw, or I think that I should base all of my, uh, my uh, inventiveness on Willy Wonka. Well, if you think about it this way, like I said, A, Roald Dahl created this book, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, originally, uh, because... Excuse the hell out of me. Because he wanted to convey good manners in children and why they should have good manners. 
So he never really said for sure of, if you don't have good manners, you're going to die. Now, two, the uh, writer of Jigsaw of the Saw series could have been inspired by this. But Dahl also said he wasn't happy with the changes that were made. Even though he wrote the screenplay, he wasn't happy with the changes that were made when it came time to film the movie. So this wasn't his original inspiration, his original direction that he wanted. Right. Now, I will say this. Gene Wilder gives a performance that is very ambiguous. Mm-hmm. And he, I'm sure he does that on purpose. And it fucking works. And he's brilliant at it. And it makes it not creepy, but he does it. Uh, I'm, I don't eccentrically. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Good word. And it works. And I can see how some twisted fuck could take that and come up with jigsaw for sure. But was he doing, was Gene Wilder playing it like that to inspire serial killers or to imply that Willy Wonka himself was a serial killer? No, I think he played it like that. And I'm sure it says it somewhere and you guys might not even know, but, I think he played it like that because he thought it would be funny. To be honest, I think it comes down to the same reason that parents tell their kids about Santa. And if you're naughty or nice, if you're naughty, you get lumps of coal. If you're nice, you get all kinds of presents and treats. This movie came out to try to say, if you're a good kid with good manners, you could end up with a chocolate factory. If you're a bad kid or a bad egg, you get punished and possibly die. What does that have to do with serial killers? Well, I'm just saying he could be luring the kids. And I go in my, I have some evidence and I have some stuff we can go over later in my conspiracy theory part. But uh, he does lure the kids in with a, what I think was a setup contest. It wasn't a real contest. He picked those kids to come in and he does punish them by luring them into traps that were specifically set to tempt each one of them. Yeah, I have the whole problem with it was fixed. I, th- I think I have plenty of evidence to prove it. I mean, you're going to invite a kid who's obsessed with TV and just happen to take him into a TV room? Sure. You're really Wonka. Other than it being a theory, is it proven anywhere? There is some proof to it. Uh, the director originally made the movie to say that the contest was fixed for Charlie to win. The producers made him remove it. And that's why Slugworth, the guy who, Wilkerson, who you know is pretending to be Slugworth, appears everywhere every time a winner wins slugworth is right there to whisper in their ears how is he at the exact location of each winner that and when you get to the salt factory he or the nut factory he's seen carrying a box in the box with the winning chocolate bar and then when she wins he's instantly there whispering in her ear i didn't i didn't see him I just saw all of the workers frantically unwrapping. I no, had to I, rewind it a couple times, and you can see some people carrying in a box, and there's his bald head down in there carrying a box. He's also just happens when Charlie wins his golden ticket, and Charlie's running home. He's on the path for Charlie running home and already knows all the details about Charlie, that he comes from a poor family, and he could really use the money. It's just he knows too much, and he's always there. There's also another fact, and we'll go over this a little bit when we get into... Why? We're, we're doing it now. Okay, you want me to go into my evidence yeah, now, do it now of why the contest is fixed? Yeah, do it. Well, you okay. have been, so continue. Okay. Well, like I said, the main thing is, is Wilkerson makes it somewhat obvious, uh, who pretends to be Slugworth, is that he is, appears every single place, every time a winner is announced. He uh, whispers in the ear about the gobstopper thing, so setting up the test for Willy Wonka. Uh Willy Wonka, even when he meets Charlie, he says to Charlie, you know, I didn't know anything else about any of the kids, but I read about you in the papers. Charlie just won the day before. How did his name or any information appear in the papers? And he doesn't specifically say newspapers. He says papers. Like, it's been, you know, given to him reports on each of the children, and he had read through about Charlie. The other thing is, the other theory that people have is Bill the Candyman. There are Bills the Candyman all over the world looking for certain types of kids. And most of them are looking for bad kids that Willy Wonka could bring into the factory and teach good manners or do as an example for Charlie. He happens to pick the kid who lives just blocks away from the actual chocolate factory. And the evidence that Charlie was picked ahead of time was scouted out by Bill is that you notice when Bill, when Charlie first comes in with his little silver dollar thing that he finds, 
And he says, I want the biggest bar you can give me. He gives him a scrump delicious bar because Charlie isn't seen as unselfish at this point. So he gives him just a bar that he knows is not going to be a winner. When Charlie then comes back in and says, I want to get one for Grandpa Joe. And this is when Charlie thought the contest was already over. He says, I want to get one for my Grandpa Joe. That's what tipped Bill off to. This is an unselfish child. So he grabs the display bar. Instead of grabbing the bars behind the display bar, like what most candy people would do, they would grab a one from behind. He grabs the specific display bar to give Charlie because Charlie has just revealed himself to be the kid that Willy Wonka is looking for. All this seems really, really fantastical. I mean, it, that sounds really out there. But, yes, it does. But, I mean, Willy Wonka is really out there. Well, there is one other mm. glaring piece of evidence that a lot of people on the internet report, which is after each child is, you know, fails their temptation test and disappears, did you notice the thing about each of the vehicles, about the car and the boat? There was only enough seats for the people remaining. So when they got on the boat... There wasn't enough seats for August and his mother, oh, Augustus no, and his mother. That. When they get on the car, there's only enough seats for those people remaining. Yeah, no. I so it's like Willy that. Wonka planned each room was going to take out two people. Huh. Well, <clears throat> now that we know that information uh, from whatever sources it comes from, does it make the movie better for you? I think it's a fun to kind of watch it and look for the things because it's one of those things that you watch the movie the first time and think, oh, it's just kind of a fun movie. And then you realize some of these theories and gives you a reason to go back and watch and say, okay, did Slugworth appear there? Was he carrying that box? Where else can I see some evidence? So yeah, it makes it more fun for me to watch the next time through. It, it gives it that rewatchability that we look for in movies. Oh, well, good for you. Does it make it better for you? No. Yeah, me too. I'm with you. All right, cool. Moving on. Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory was released on June 30th, 1971. It was directed by Mel Stewart, screenplay by Roald Dahl, book by Roald Dahl, and it stars Gene Wilder, Jack Albertson, Peter Ostrom, Roy Kinnear, Denise Nickerson, Leonard Stone, Julia Dawn Cole, Paris Themen, Nora Denny, Michael Bolner, Ursula Rett, and Gunter Meisner. A poor but hopeful boy seeks one of the five golden tickets. You guys know what the movie's about. <laughs> uh, this this movie was made for three million dollars back in 1971. Are that's you fucking I, kidding me with that's that? What I think it's crazy. Jeez, I mean, 1971, three million. But if you think about it, some of the rooms that they go into, like the room with the chocolate river, yeah. They actually made a chocolate river. Oh, yeah. They had to. Nothing. Yeah. They had to. Everything was practical. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it was made for $3 million, but it only made $4.5 million. Mm -hmm. So, made its money back, basically. Yeah. But then it skyrocketed with video sale or rentals. Things oh, like this, that. This, movie, uh, has, this movie is a classic, for sure. And any list that you look at, uh, when you think classic movies of any kind, Willy Wonka is somewhere in there. Um Definitely a musical. Absolutely a musical. Wait, what? And we should have probably addressed this earlier, but we let John do his thing with his theories. It's a fucking musical, dude. Out of all your genres, four of your films were fucking musicals. Fucking musicals. But is it not a food movie? I don't fucking, uh, I don't fucking care anymore. Wait a it could minute. also kind of be a period piece. Uh, okay, but... but <laughs> it is, it is not in 1971, it couldn't. Is Chef a food movie? Could you take the food out of Chef and still have that movie be the movie it was? But once again, you you initially said that the food has to be a part of the story. It line. has to be essential. So, okay, to your point, yes, you could take the food out of the movie and it would still kind of kind of be the same story. We've seen it. We've seen it. It probably wouldn't have been as good as a, of a movie, right? Mm -hmm. But the food brings in the element because that is... It, it was central to the story because that was the uh, plot of it. They were getting this food truck off the ground, yeah. right? It, it was the driving force. Yeah, so I same, would call that a food movie. Same with um, uh, the candy, okay? It was I'll, called I'll, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Thank you, Captain Obvious. I know what movie we fucking watched. I had to fucking watch it and rewind it because I fell asleep. But 
My point is, could you take the candy out of this movie? Yes, you fucking could. Would it be a good movie? No, I'm not saying it would be. But you could technically make this Willy Wonka and the Pillow Sales. But it wouldn't be the same movie, and that's what the criteria ne- of a food movie and is. And neither would Chef. Exactly, I'm saying. So both are food movies because the criteria is if you take the food out of the movie, it's not the same movie. The food was a driving factor in the movie. So in this, the chocolate factory and all the candy and all the edibles and everything in it was a driving factor in the movie. So hence, it falls under the criteria of a food movie. And again, we're going to go back to, you know, uh, which genre I assumed you guys would put uh, foremost in the, uh, when you're thinking of picking movies. And I mean, clearly you didn't, and that's fine because this is first and foremost a musical. Yeah. Just like Moulin Rouge was. But it can be multiple Just like fucking things. Blues Brothers was. It can be multiple things. Well, anything could be. It was in the spirit. Tommy it was in the Boy. spirit. It was in the spirit of the genre. It was yeah. in the spirit of what we were doing. And you wanted to do it, and you put a twist to it, and good for you. I mean, like but Tommy, they were all fucking musicals. But Tommy Boy could have been a buddy movie or a road movie. I mean, we're not, it could be multiple we're things. We're not... I, what did I just fucking say? Yes, the, anything can be multiple. Yeah. Any movie can be multiple genres. Well, Absolutely. In the, But what I'm saying is, and I'll say it again, it's the spirit of what we were doing. In the spirit of what we were doing. But here's where I got to disagree with you. You call it a musical first and foremost. The director didn't want the music in the movie. He wanted to make the movie without the music. So first and foremost, he wanted it to be a food movie. He uh, did uh, in a movie about kids and teaching them good manners and all that. It was in the spirit of movies like Wizard of Oz that the producers made him put the music in it. I wanted the Titanic not to hit the iceberg, but yeah. it did. Yeah. It's still a fucking musical. Titanic's a musical? It could be. Fucking enough, Leon Dion Rose must go on. Yeah, you know. <laughs> I'm glad we're here to fucking amuse you, Professor. He's pissing me off. We haven't even gotten into it, and Job we're already fucking well this many. We're already fucking. So oh. I'm working on both your last nerves. Is that what you're telling me? I don't know what I'm fucking telling you. It's good to have us back. <laughs> Willy Willie Wonka and the Chocolate Factory begins with the eccentric candy maker, Willy Wonka. When he announces a contest where he hid five golden tickets and chocolate bars around the world that will grant the finder access to his factory, it sets off a worldwide craze. Charlie Bucket lives with his poor family and his grandpa Joe encourages him to keep participating in the frenzy, even to the point he gives Charlie false hope. Charlie uses his extra money on one chocolate bar after the other. Surprisingly, he finds the last ticket. On the day of the event... Five children, with one adult in tow, enter the factory. There, they find a wonderland of candy and chocolate beyond their dreams. However, even though Willy Wonka seems like a kind man, it's quickly obvious he's testing each child for something greater. Will Charlie pass the test? End movie. And as you can tell from our opening discussion, yes, Charlie wins. (laughs) Yeah. All right, so let's let's talk about this movie a little bit. Uh, the opening. You have your standard opening number with your song. I think it's like 45 minutes before we even get to Willy Wonka. Yeah, and so... I wanted to, yeah, I wanted to bring that up as well. It's a long time before we see Willy Wonka. And you know what kind of impressed me with this movie was how well the family, Charlie and his family, they carry this first half of the movie. Right. So we open up and we meet this Charlie kid and we can easily tell that this kid doesn't have much. And uh, the kid who played him, Peter Ostrom, I thought he did a great job. I really felt, you know, that he was just this kid and didn't have a lot. And like I said, I thought they carried this movie in the uh, in the beginning. Apparently, uh, Peter, this actor, Peter, he was offered a five-picture movie deal yeah, after this one was made, yeah. and he decided he didn't want to act. He wanted to do something else with his life. He became a veterinarian. Yeah, he used the money he got from this movie to become a veterinarian. Yeah. And he's been happy with that the rest of his life. Yeah, crazy, huh? Uh, when Gene Wilder died in 2016, um, Peter Ostrom had his title changed from, uh, it used to say, like, former child star and veterinarian. And now it says uh, former child star, veterinarian, 
and chocolate factory owner as of August 16th, 19, or 2016. Mm-hmm. So I thought that was sweet. The other thing I really like about it too is that he and the other actors in the movie have stayed in touch and that they're good friends and they actually go to all the conventions together. Yeah. I want to talk about the uh, Candyman song at the be- beginning, our first song. I found it unusual the way uh, he, I don't know, he just feels a little on the creepy side w- with his uh, fixation on the kids. And I get it. It's a whole different era. Bill the Candyman. But watching it now, it's just like, hmm. I just want to put it right out there that Bill the Candyman is a dick. Why? Because if you notice in his intro song, first of all, he's going through and he's singing and he's you know making all the, the rich kids happy, giving them free candy. He's just pouring it in their hands and giving them stuff to eat and lick and all this stuff. He even at one point opens up his little door to come out and he bashes a kid in the head, keeps going, just ignores it. But then you notice when he gets to Charlie, the poor kid, he first of all expects Charlie to pay right away. And tells Charlie he's eating too fast when these other kids were gorging on the candy. So he's kind of a dick to the poor kid. Well, I don't, yeah, he's probably a dick, but I think his bigger problem is who lets the kids behind the fucking counter? Yeah. And what candy shop do you walk in? Does the owner just, or the guy behind the counter just start giving you fucking candy? Who's paying for all this candy? That's what I was thinking. I mean, for fuck's sakes. Now, originally, Sammy Davis Jr. really wanted this role. And they thought he was too famous for this role and would be would take away attention from the other actors in the series. So much so that, San, or that Sammy Davis Jr., that's why he recorded the song Candyman. And it became one of his biggest hits on his live shows. But uh, what would you think it would have been okay with, with Sammy Davis? Or do you think he, they made a good call with this guy? As soon as uh, Bill the... Butcher started singing the Candyman. I immediately thought of Sammy Davis Jr. Yeah, because that's so I. that's where I know the song from. Yeah, yeah. It, he did the song after the movie. Yeah, but still, yeah, no, I, I I know that. Yeah, well, I thought well, he would have been good in the movie. I thought he would have been. I would have loved Sammy Davis Jr. in this movie. Mm-hmm. I mean, the casting was fine, and it, overall, it's not a bad film. I mean, it's not horrible, uh, but clearly the the uh, the star of the show is Gene Wilder, mm-hmm. right? So. Would he have overshadowed Gene Wilder? No, because the Candyman's in it for five seconds. Yeah. And he's at the very beginning. Yeah. A long screen time passes where we have no uh, Willy Wonka, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, it's like 45 minutes. Crazy, huh? Yeah. Did you have any other thoughts about this Candyman or this scene, Professor? Uh, I just thought one of the kids looked like a young Leonard Nimoy. I think it's the one that talks, right? Yeah. Is the one that... He's says got something. like a yellow shirt. I yeah, think. yeah, kind of. I was trying to see if there were any actors that I noticed that, you know, they w- would have been kids when they filmed this. Yeah. But no I do, luck. if you do ever go back and rewatch this or you catch us on TV, you need to watch as he comes out from behind the counter. And then when he goes back behind the counter, mm-hmm. he lifts up the thing and you can see this little blonde girl in the front who just gets her face knocked way back <laughs> it's the funniest thing to watch if you catch it well so basically what you're saying is this movie is dick to kids yeah basically it just yeah, well, screws over the kids 1971 right it was a different time yeah so what do you what do you think of a family where all they do is sit in bed all day well see that's what i kind of wondered as well so you have both sets of grandparents and uh i guess the, never get dressed right uh, they haven't moved in 20 years apparently i'm thinking how do they go to the bathroom I wonder that too. Do they have a whole (laughs) chamber pods? (laughs) Um, But I guess there was a dad and he is in the book and he's actually in the uh, shitty remake. Um, Yeah, I fucking said it. The shitty remake. Um, But he's not in this one. And I, and I kind of like that about it. I thought I kind of like her a widower. Yeah. And that, you know, Charlie was the man of the house and he was a good, and he was a good soul. And so, um, Yeah. Uh, I, I thought that was that was kind of funny, you know, all of them in bed. Charlie's character is definitely the most likable character in the movie. Oh, hands down. Yeah. What about Grandpa Joe? You're not a fan of Grandpa Joe? I no. didn't say that. He, uh, we said that Charlie is the most likable. I would say Grandpa Joe is very likable. I love the, the, the inner kid in him, and I love that he always had hope, and he's always believing, and he's that guy. He's the one who the glass is always half full um we'll get to it but when they go into the factory and to do the bubble thing 
That was Grandpa Joe's fault. Charlie shouldn't have been punished for that, but we'll talk about it. But one thing I do want to point out about Grandpa Joe, and one of the things to kind of look for when you go back and rewatch this movie, is the actor who played Grandpa Joe, Jack Albertson, who played it, uh, I believe is in World War II. One. Was it World War One? he fought in? Yes, that was when gases were used. Yeah, he got hit in the face with mustard gas. So he was almost completely blind when they made this movie. So you don't even notice that in this movie. He did such a great job acting. Yeah, I, th- I thought I really liked Grandpa Joe. To get him to look in the direction that he needed to, they used a red light for him to look at. Oh, yeah, there you go. So what did you think of Charlie's teacher? He was a dick. <laughs> did not like him at all. I loved him. I thought he was hilarious, I but kinda, I would. I kind of felt like he was a character out of Mon- Monty Python. I can see that. I can see that a little bit. Yeah. Um, but he's so condescending, and he, he was teaching them uh, percentages, which I thought was funny. <laughs> no, not 200, 2%. Well, I don't want to do the math on that. So let's just say it was 200, right? So, yeah, I like the teacher. Um, let's talk about these four contest winners. Uh, Augustus Gloop. Well, let's talk about Veruca. She was the first shown to us. Oh, look at this guy. No, Augustus won first. Augustus won first. He was the first one to win. He was in a restaurant, and it actually just happened to be, because this was filmed in Germany, Yeah, it just happened to be a restaurant that was near the set that all of the crew used to go to, so they decided to film the scene with Augustus in there, and I guess he was eating some type of sausage. The kid was eating some type of sausage, Uh and hated the sausage and so every take if you kind of look at his face he's miserable eating these chalk or these uh sausage that's awesome that's awesome um uh, you know quiet character doesn't really say much uh but veruca now that little shit oh my gosh her screaming drove me up the fucking wall mm-hmm. i want it i want it now i know i know what do you got she sucked. And, uh, you know, I, I, I got to say that, you know, there are parents that that are out there in the world that let their children become that because of the parents. Who was more annoying, Veruca Salt or uh, uh, Violet's father? Which, oh, the, the car salesman? The, the politician slash car salesman. Uh, Veruca, hands down. You think so? Yeah. 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 Easy. Uh, speaking of Violet, she does she win third? Who wins third? She's third. And then I think it's Mike, Mike TV. Mikey yep. the TV guy. And then he's gone and then Charlie's left. Yeah. 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 And I, what I, I kind of enjoyed about this film was the little uh, Willy Wonka moments, as I called them. So like the uh, newscaster who kept broadcasting gets all upset when he doesn't win. And then the uh, psychiatrist. Uh, the psychiatrist bit was funny, and there was another one, and the I can't think scene? of it. The computer scene, that was fun. but That there was, was one they just decided to add, I guess, last minute. <laughs> that was pretty funny. But there was one I thought, oh, the kidnap, the kidnapper ransom one. That one I, I laughed out loud. Uh, the wife saw, I'll give you anything you want, anything you want, because they kidnapped her husband, right? And the kidnappers say, well, we want your box of chocolate, uh, we want your box of Wonka bars. Right, and she right. was all, how much time will they give me to think about it? Now, <laughs> so I thought that was pretty funny. This was actually a clever part that they did of reusing actors is that the woman in the ransom scene who was trying to decide if she was going to give up her box chocolate is the same woman who was the newscaster that interviewed Mike TV. Oh, really? Yep. So hmm. that's just, they, they reuse certain actors in certain parts. Yeah. See, it's been going on forever. So you shouldn't be mad at Kevin Smith when he does it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then, so we, uh, then a fifth ticket comes out. And, well, you know it's not the real ticket because Charlie gets the real ticket. But they set it up nicely, and it turns out to be a fake, and it just so happens because of movie convenience. Charlie found a uh, a coin in the gutter, takes it out, goes to gets a snickle fritz. What's he, what do you call it? Scrum dilliumptious? S- scrum, dil- scrum dilliumptious bar. Yep, and then gets the golden ticket. Out of the other bar. Out of the other bar, and now we know that you know, Charlie's going to the factory and this was his dream, right? Him and his grandpa, you could tell that his grandpa's like his best friend. Yeah. Really quick, just to go back a little bit for the guy that won in Paraguay. Did you catch the little thing that they snuck in there? 
the person that they name is based off of an actual Nazi that was on the run that they thought was in Paraguay. So they were kind of portraying it as this bad guy, you know, doing this hoax who was an actual real person in history. No, I didn't catch that. Yeah, it was just another little thing for his history buffs. That's the kind of thing they snuck in there. Yeah, dude. I had no idea. So there's a, for a time, you know, for a 1971 movie, they snuck in a lot of little Easter eggs in there. Well, I think movies have been sneaking in Easter eggs from the beginning of time. You think so, so, oh yeah. None of that era pop into my head right at the moment, but you know, mm-hmm. they're there if you look for them. And if not, you could just troll the internet and find them. Mm-hmm. So, a lot of great conspiracy theories. Yeah, well, I don't I wouldn't use the word great, but Moving on. So, yeah, Charlie finds the golden ticket. Now we're about 45 minutes into the movie. I know you've all seen this movie before, but every time I see that scene where he pulls out that bar and he gets his golden ticket and he gets surrounded by all the people, I kept expecting someone just to snag the ticket out of his hands and run off with it. Oh, yeah, so did I. And who is the, oh, it was like a shop owner or someone. I think he was the, he the was, magazine. He was the newsstand. Guy. Right. Yeah. And they, and they, we had already established that Charlie knew him. They have a relationship. Yeah. He works yeah, from yeah. delivering papers. Yeah. Right. 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 So yeah, uh, we get to, oh, Charlie rushes home and says, Grandpa Joe, I want you to come with me. And you know, that was, that was kind of a sweet, tender moment. And then we get an, another song. Oh yeah. We get another song because what kind of mo- movie is this uh, professor? A food movie. Are you the fucking professor? Shut the fuck up. Uh, what kind of movie is this, professor? Helpful. It's a musical. <laughs> you just call me an asshole. No, I said I was just being helpful. Uh, yes, professor, you're 100% correct. Moving on. Well, actually, it, it is first listed on IMDb as family. And yeah, I can see that, too. I don't think they normally list family movies as serial killer movies, but, you know. The, inter- curious, the internet must be right. There is a curious thought. Here's a thought too, and and one of the reasons why it may not fit into the period piece is the director decided he wanted to keep vehicles out of this movie so that it wouldn't date the movie. I think I read that too. Yeah, I did notice that there weren't any vehicles in it, and mm-hmm. it was a shitty time to grow up. <laughs> yeah. yeah, those roads were wide open. Yeah. For sure, for sure. What do uh, you so, think about the uh, the Grandpa Joe, you know, getting out of bed for the first time in 20 years? I thought it was comedic. It wasn't? I, I thought it was light and fun. Like I said, I really dug this family. They they really carried the, the movie mm-hmm. uh, up until we get Gene Wilder. Because once Gene Wilder gets on the screen, I mean, the screen is his, mm-hmm. right? And it, uh, this might be watching this again. This might be, you know, top two performances for Gene Wilder for me, you know, this and young Frankenstein, obviously. And not the Frisco kid. I, I, and tell you the truth. I don't think I've ever seen the Frisco kid. I'm just going to say it. It's in the hat. I would say this is the most iconic role for Gene Wilder. And when you think of actors playing iconic roles, this has to easily be in the top five of all actors out there for just, you know, Han Solo. That's, you know, gotta be Harrison Ford, you know, certain characters. That's just who they are. When you think of Willy Wonka, you're going to think of Gene Wilder. Uh, My wife doesn't. I was going to say, I I think you have, after that remake, I think you have a lot of people. I think a lot of people would disagree with you on that. Yeah. Younger people, maybe. No, No, I, I would say smarter people would agree with you. Okay. Yeah. So. <laughs> now, I didn't say the sexier Willy Wonka. No, I w- no. We heard what you said, and I, like I said, you know, after after that stupid god awful remake. Um. But yeah. So now. So now Willy Wonka comes out to greet the public. What'd you think of his uh, entrance? You know, I, I I read about his whole little bit, and it's like, oh yeah, okay. Um, it worked. Oh, it absolutely worked 100%. I loved it. He comes yeah. out and limp in, and he said he would only do the role if he got to do this stunt. And uh, he really gave the director no choice because yeah. the director wanted uh, Gene Wilder. They wanted him so bad that I think it was uh, the producers or someone got mad at the director. For because he chased Gene Wilder down the hallway, offering it to him. And like, wait, 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 we haven't even discussed how much his salary is going to be. Yeah, so, I mean, it was a, like a blank check for 
uh, Gene Wilder. Did you read why Gene Wilder insisted that they put this scene in for him limping out and then doing the role? Because from the get-go, from the moment we meet Willy Wonka, you never know if he's telling the truth or not. Exactly. A sign of a serial killer. And it's also the sign of just a pathological liar. Or an eccentric. Doesn't make him a fucking serial killer is my point. That's fair. Thank you, sir. All right. So we <laughs> asshole. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> there we are. And we're back, ladies and gentlemen. We meet Willy Wonka. He comes out and he greets the kids. I like how he greets the family and he's just so, you know Gracious. Yes, gracious. That's a good word. And then, you know, even though they're little shits to him, uh most of them, except for Charlie, of course. Uh but I like the way he greets the family and then they lock up the factory again and then they go into the room and now we're inside Willy Wonka's chocolate factory. And we get the, with the optical illusions and everything, we get that you can't, you know, don't expect anything. Everything is kind of out of the ordinary. Yeah, I guess a lot of the first impressions of the cast when they walk in is what we see in the film. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of like they did with the Goonies, right? Yeah, they, they surprised them on a lot of things. The one thing I thought was interesting was the contract that they signed at the beginning. And he's going through all the you know, mumbo jumbo and he throws it if you catch it real quick. You know, he is not responsible. They would not be responsible for any bodily harm. Yeah. So it's like, that's why he was so apathetic about each child or whatever getting hurt or whatever was because. You know, no sweat off his brow. Exactly. He can't sue him. Although technically they're under 18. Who knows what the contracts were like back then. But, you know, he just had them sign away all their rights. Yeah. No, I, I, I like that scene because I, I was thinking to myself, they're not just going to, you know, sign it willy nilly. I like that the parents put up a protest and the parents are like, what the fuck is this? No, no, no. We're not signing anything. And then the kids. Who was the right? first to sign? It was Veruca because yeah, she, she wanted, wanted it. Yeah. She wanted to be first. So that kind of opened the floodgates. And what I did appreciate and what I did love was Grandpa Joe. Go on, go sign it, Charlie. Mm -hmm. He didn't fucking care because he, he says, what do we have to lose? Yeah, we have nothing to lose. Yeah, so I again, I, I really like the Grandpa Joe character. I like mm -hmm. this the spirit he embodied mm -hmm. and the youthfulness. So uh, we now we get to the first room, which is the chocolate room, right? Yeah. And this is where we see our first kid go. But what did you what did you think of the chocolate room? The chocolate room is incredibly elaborate, and it is a sight to behold. A lot of effort went into the room, and it is spectacular to look at. Agreed, hundred percent. You. When I read the behind-the-scenes making of that, uh, first of all, the scene where he's coming down the stairs and he's singing his song and he's flipping his cane around, I guess several takes, he whacked those kids hard. In fact, one of them has a permanent scar from where he whacked one of the kids. No way. Uh, the chocolate river uh, was made with chocolate, water, and cream, and the cream curdled. So that whole river just stunk oh up the God. whole place. Imagine? So the kids were miserable, especially... Augustus, who had to, you know, actually get close to the river and fall in, and it was just a nasty. Originally, they didn't use cream; they just used chocolate, and it turned blood red. Oh, how funny. So they had to put the cream in to, you know, brown it down a little bit to make it actually look like chocolate. Um, the other thing is to watch for in this scene is Veruca Salt at one point goes down to kind of eat this melon thing, and goes down on a rock and cuts her knee open. And I guess you could see blood on her stocking later. And she still, the actress who played that part, still has a scar on her knee for where she cut her, her knee on that rock. Do you think Willy Wonka was staring at her? Look at the blood. I think so. Look, he was kind of going, get look, closer to the river. Look get at the closer. blood. Professor, don't encourage him. But no, that, you're mm -hmm. absolutely right. That scene was spectacular. Yeah, as you said earlier, Don, um, none of the actors were shown that ahead of time. So their reactions when they first come into that room are genuine reactions. Yeah, I know. So I just thought it was just, you know, a pretty neat. Agreed. Neat I thought stuff. it was, I thought it was fantastic. And I like how he walks around. Is this where he sings Imagination? Yes. I think it is. Okay. So let's talk about this song for a second. <laughs> Why don't you tell us a little background with you and that song? Oh my God. This fucking song. Uh, I used to work for a company that, uh, we were clients for this other big company and they were releasing this product and the video, the sizzle reel that they used was, uh, you know, an updated version of pure imagination. And I listened to that song on a loop for like four days straight. Cause I was backstage. I can't stand this fucking song. And unfortunately because of that traumatizing experience, 
that song takes me out of the movie it was originally made for. So when you were watching it, what, 10 minutes before we started this, Mm -hmm. were you ready to kill me? Well, no, I, as soon as we pulled it out of the hat, I wanted to kick you in the balls for three reasons. One, fuck you. Two, fuck you. And three, it's a musical. So there you go. That happens to be a food movie. In a period piece. You know, I think people are tired of hearing me. You son of a bitch. It is not a fucking... Drive me up the fucking wall. It can't be a period piece. You already said there's no cars that... Are, there is as few vehicles as possible, so that way it would be a timeless movie. I know, but sometimes you gotta poke the tiger. <sighs> I lost my fucking train of thought. Where were we? Oh, we pure lose- imagination. Yeah, and we are about to lose Augustus, Augustus into Gloop. the Chocolate River. That's right. Okay, so we're in the Chocolate Room, and uh, Augustus was clearly uh, the sin for gluttony because uh, he overindulged in a lot of things, as his appearance would tell us. And he goes in and he drinks the chocolate. Chocolate River. And uh, Wonka's like, no, you can't fucking well, do that. This is our first introduction to wonka and what he cares about and his apathy and that notice he stresses out about the river he's going to ruin the chocolate he's going to ruin the chocolate and then he starts to fall and he's like oh no he watch does, out he does that for all of them yeah i know he just doesn't even care about the kids safety yeah. he cares about his factory which i think had to have been a choice by gene wilder yeah which yeah. it pays off it's fucking hilarious oh no don't go you don't, know one don't of those things it. yeah i do that shit all the time um, so yeah, he falls in and <clears throat> this is where we first meet the Oompa Loompas as well. Yeah. Yep. You know what else tells me it's a fucking musical professor that when the Oompa Loompas start singing their song, our screen shrinks, goes to the left of the side of the screen and oh, we yeah. get the words to the fucking song. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, this Remember was that a kids movie about a serial killer. You son of a bitch. Now the thing about the Oompa Loompas, have you read some of the background stories of the Oompa Loompas, the actors? I guess they were partiers. They go out drinking every night. They'd have a limo, take them to a bar. They'd come back with all hangovers the next day. Some of them weren't native English speakers. So that's why if you watch the music parts with them, some of them are just mouthing the words and not doing it very well. And then the one thing I haven't caught, and now again, I I guess I want to go back and kind of rewatch is one of there was a female, and I never caught where the female was. I knew that when I read that, that that is something that John is going to be scrutinizing extremely yeah. close. Yeah. Now, originally, I guess in the original book, it took on a little bit more of a racist tone in that they were pygmies from Africa, but they changed it later on in a future revision of the book and in the movie to be the Oompa Loompas. Saved himself a headache there. Yeah. Because there's no way this movie would have been no. watchable now. No, but I thought... Or, or I, probably even back then. Who knows? But what'd you think of the Oompa Loompas? They were the Oompa Loompas. That's about it. That's one of those songs. I know for you it's pure imagination, but every time I watch this movie and I hear the Oompa I cannot get Oompa Loompa out of my head. That's the first Shocker. song. That's the first song I think of when I think of this movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well... We know what mine is. <clears throat> so Augustus is gone, and then the boat comes along. And like you said earlier, there was only enough seats, which I never noticed, mm-hmm. which now kind of makes sense And going back and thinking about it. Yeah. Uh, so the boat comes along, and this, this scene is what I always think of when I think of Willy Wonka. I think of this tunnel scene and him freaking out and this, the imagery and everything about that. This scene uh, was a little strange. Uh, a little psychotic. It was a freak out. Yeah, he totally was freaking out. And, you know, Gene Wilder plays it perfectly. Uh, again, now, Professor, do you know the story behind this scene with people's reactions? I do. The uh, children were uh, unhinged by Gene Wilder's performance. They were completely un- uh, completely uh, off guard with Gene's interpretation of how he was behaving as we heard at the beginning of this show, courtesy of you, which I think might be our new TikTok video. So the children did not expect this performance at all, and they were very, very uneasy and thinking that he had snapped or something. Now, even the adult actors didn't know, because originally they had heard him sing it. This was the only song in the whole movie that came directly from the book the poem was in the book oh yeah and so 
they didn't know to what to expect. They'd always seen him read his lines quietly and passively. And he went off the side and they thought, especially when he started screaming, they thought he had lost it. And then all of the things that they're seeing, you know, the cannibal stuff going on, people with bugs coming out of their mouth, which I guess was one of the producers or something, uh, one of the side directors, agreed to have this centipede put on his, multipede put on his face. Um, all of that stuff was filmed and, and all of it going on just was chaos. Yeah. And then they come out the other side. Mm-hmm. And where do they come into? They show up to the, uh, the secret room. The inventing room. Oh, right. The inventing room. And this is where we get the everlasting, everlasting gobstopper. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And, and then we're told earlier on in the film that, uh, as we talked about in the opening, this dude shows up and uh, claims to be uh, one of Wonka's or Slugworth. Slugworth, Wonka's biggest rival, and wants him to st- wants one of the kids to steal them a everlasting gobstopper Mm -hmm. and they come in and they see how this thing was made and they get an everlasting gobstopper and then they move on well they move on to the gum machine that uh violet spots that makes a three-course meal into a piece of gum yeah and since we've already been introduced to violet as a gum chewer uh, she has a piece of three-month-old gum in her mouth awesome uh, naturally she takes the bait and you know, maybe Willy Wonka is setting all these up. Yeah. Maybe he is luring them in like Jigsaw. Um, so Violet chews the gum and what she get? She gets, um, she gets a, uh, a, a soup, tomato soup, pouring yeah. out hot tomato soup down her throat, a roast beef with mashed potatoes. Yep. And then for dessert, a blueberry pie. And, Violet turns into a blueberry. Yeah. The interesting thing I thought of, or heard about this, of course, they didn't have CGI or special effects back then. So they had to use all kinds of different treatments, lighting. Uh, originally, they had to inflate the suit around her. And then they cut to a scene with her in a giant styrofoam ball. But they had to do the blue makeup on her. And I guess the poor actress, when they cleaned all that off, first of all, when she was in the inflatable suit, they didn't want to take her out to do, you know, during lunch breaks or anything. So they kept her in the suit and they kept having to roll her around to keep her circulation going. And then when they took all the makeup off off her and she went back to school, I guess every time she started sweating, the blue came out of her pores and she actually turned blue during one of her classes. That's awesome. And so she got a nickname, I guess, Blueberry. So if if this is indeed the case, I am curious to know, do you have a theory as to why Charlie's uh, vulnerability would be the bubble room? You know, I think, and Don, you brought this up earlier, it wasn't Charlie that chose to drink the drink. It was Grandpa Joe's pressure on Charlie to drink the drink, um, saying, come on, let's do it. Nobody's watching. Let's do it. And so Charlie gave in to peer pressure because Charlie was an easygoing kid. I don't, I don't think it was peer pressure. I think he trusts his Grandpa Joe with his life, and if Grandpa thinks it's a good idea... He did it. So yeah, I I think that uh, Char I think Charlie gets punished yeah. uh, uh, unjustly. I don't think, and all the other traps were set specifically to tempt the children. Violet happens to be addicted to gum chewing, and here's this piece of gum that's gonna turn her into a blueberry. This one for Charlie wasn't specifically targeted at him. I don't think so either. So that's, that's why Charlie it. didn't get in you know trouble really for it. So this was so this would be Willy Wonka's style of giving a pass to Charlie yeah. insofar as not setting a trap if you will. Well, first of all, Charlie was picked early on to win it. So there was no specific trap targeted at Charlie because Willy Wonka wanted him to win. He had already decided ahead of time he wanted to win or he wanted to groom him as the future jigsaw. That's the other theory. But if you think about this room where he's floating up and everything, there was, besides burping, they could have died. If had they not burped, they would have died. There would have been blood splatter up there and everything. No little Oompa Loompa song unless they wanted to sing about, you know, pieces of Charlie and Grandpa. But there could have been an actual death there. I don't know. I don't buy that one as much. Because I, I, I can see, you know, from that perspective, the Augustus Gloop in a, a river of, of chocolate. I can see the gluttony of that. I understand uh, Violet 
and the gluttony of her gum choice. I think Violet could have exploded at the end. Yeah, we just, they rolled her out before she exploded. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then um, Veruca, I, I, I guess I can kind of sort of see uh, her lust for uh, a huge piece of gold. Oh, I a and, and and a, a scale that weighs a bad nut versus a good nut. Oh, that was definitely designed for Veruca. Yeah, because she was a bad nut. And How, she came from a nut factory. A Her bad, father owned a, a nut factory. Egg. I'm sorry, you're getting mixed up with Charlie and the Chocolate yeah. Factory. I didn't think that was going to happen tonight, because it, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory is a bad nut. Willy Wonka is a bad egg. Oh, in the original book, semantics. In the original book, it was a nut. It was squirrels and nuts, which they put into the musical and into the uh, Johnny Depp version, the remake. In this movie, you're right; they replaced it with the bad egg. And then uh, Wonka Vision totally makes sense. Um, but if Charlie was already picked to win it, then why he had to have a test? Though he, he all of the kids had to have he a test. He did have a test, and he passed his test. Right, I know, but the test, how did Wonka know that Charlie was going to give in to the bubbles? I don't think that was expected. I don't think, because you notice they had moved on. He wasn't there to witness like he was with the other kids when they fell into the traps. He still got caught. He wasn't there to witness him with the bubble machine. So I don't think that was expected. The real test for all of the kids, if you want to go with the theory that it wasn't all set up, was were they going to keep the gobstopper? Hmm. And Charlie passed the test when he gave back the gobstopper at the end. That was his passing the test. Interesting. Because Willy Wonka even says, you passed the test. Yeah, I know. So he wins. We know he wins. But I don't... I'm I'm having a hard time buying that Charlie was the predestined winner. That's what I think. Okay, you like to play what ifs. What if Violet decides not to be a shit and not eat the gum? Yeah, then it would have come down to the gobstopper. Would she have returned the gobstopper? Right. My point is there was a test there. He no. he assumed that they were bad, and he assumed that they would fail the test. You're saying, or whoever's saying, is that Charlie was the predestined winner, but yet he still had to go through the test. What if Charlie kept the fucking gobstopper? Then he wouldn't have gotten the factory. Right. So I'm. I, I think he that. Well, just, that just kind of proves then it. W- he wasn't the destined. He might have been the favorite to win it, but I don't think he was no, predestined to win it. I think it. Wonka planned for all of the kids to fail. Like, there wasn't even tests for them. It was just temptation traps. They were all going to fall into the traps to to the point of only Charlie was going to be left. And the whole thing was really just testing Charlie. Yeah. That's what it all comes down to. It wasn't a test for the other kids. He knew they were going to lose. Yeah, but what if they didn't? I'd say if they come down to it, if they hadn't lost, if the script had been written a different way, then it would have come down to would they have given Slugworth the Godsopper? Any thoughts, Professor? Or just giving me that glare? No, I'm just uh, 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 digesting a a new approach to the movie that I've never had before, to think of it as a uh, a vehicle for um, showing bad children deserve what they get and and that Charlie was ultimately picked from the beginning. Yeah, it's really... Yeah, just a new take. Really, the movie was made to show that... Children with bad manners have bad things happen to them that they should have good manners. And Charlie wins because of his good manners. It was, that was the point of the movie. And that's what I generally had as well. But, you know, to take it a step further and to say that you have these children that are given a uh, test that is meant to have them fail. I, I never thought of it like that before. That here is a situation specifically designed to make you fail. Mm-hmm. Uh, where did we leave off? We talked about Violet and her gum. And then we spent 10 seconds talking about Mike TV. Yeah. What did you think of that kid? Oh, he was annoying. All the kids were annoying. Yeah. But they played it perfectly. Mm-hmm. So it was still a good cast. I don't know. He seems like a kid of today, you know, wanting his Xbox time. Or his I, phone. I or guess phone. the actor Paris, this is his name, that played that role was 11 at the time. He was the youngest of the kids. And he was also the most annoying they said that he caused all kinds of problems on set. He liked to play pranks. In the scene that you see where they're making the four-course uh, 
piece of gum or the three course meal piece of gum. Mm-hmm. You had the bees and which for interesting enough, they were wasps who don't make honey, but the wasps in the thing making the honey, when that scene was finished filming, he opened it up and let all the wasps out. That's awesome. And he got stung on the face several times because well, of it. That's what you But did. he was constantly doing things like that. And when Jill Wilder talked in interviews about making this movie, he talked about how great all the kids were. But then when he got to Paris, he just said he was a handful. Yeah, well, he was being polite. Yeah. He's being polite. Now, for Veruca, the actress that played Veruca... Um, I guess she was really nice. Her and the actress that paid Violet had a crush on Peter, uh, on the boy, uh, and were always trying to compete for his attention. But she actually turned 13 while on the set. It was her birthday when they filmed the scene with the uh, golden eggs mm-hmm. and gave her one of the golden eggs as a birthday present. Oh, isn't that sweet? But she was also told not to take home any other props from the movie, and she took home like everything. Yeah, why wouldn't you? So she just recently sold a few of them when the remake came out. Yeah. Speaking of Veruca, her death scene is the scale, uh, good egg versus bad egg. Well, she had a 50% chance of surviving, according to Willy Wonka. Well, yeah, you're either good or bad. Well, he said that the fires in the boiler room in the furnace, or garbage chute, excuse me, the fires in the garbage chute are only lit on every other day. So she had a 50% chance of not getting burned up. Right. And then, after Veruca is, oh, we talked about Homeboy. Mike TV. Mike TV. That's all of them, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. And I just left. Charlie left. Yeah. And so, Charlie, oh, they go to leave, and Wonka's like, all right, nice see you, bud. Yeah, yeah. just says now, goodbye, see you later. The prize that they were promised at the end of it is one of them would get a lifetime supply of chocolate. And so, that's why Grandpa Joe returns to the office to say, What's going on? Why isn't he getting the prize? Do you notice that everything in his office was cut in half? Yeah. Did and, you hear the story behind that one? Yeah, because he, they didn't want... After this fantastical ride throughout the factory to walk into a mundane office would have been silly. So they cut everything in half. I did read a kind of an interesting fact. Uh, during the making of that, when they're cutting all the different things in half, someone left a coffee maker in the room with all the different props and so the guy cutting them in half ended up cutting in half the coffee maker not realizing there was still coffee in there and got coffee everywhere well that's what happens when you cut it in half you're gonna get coffee everywhere so it wasn't meant to be cutting so imagine bringing your stuff into work and guy cuts it in half yeah well i mean part for the course you were making a movie yeah but i did think it was clever everything cut now it was kind of a fun fun way to do that the other thing along the way uh, earlier on did you read the part about the wallpaper yeah, that it was a real wallpaper. It was a real wallpaper with no smells or taste, and it tasted horrible, and they actually made the actors and the kids lick the wall yeah. over and over again. Yeah. Hey, that's what you're getting paid to do. Suck it up, buttercup. That's right. Know your fucking lines, come in on time, hit your fucking marks, and shut the fuck up, right? Damn right. Damn right. Grandpa goes back being the good dude. Wonka yells at him, and then... Charlie walks back and probably thinks that he w- doesn't deserve the gobstopper because he listened to his grandfather and they got high. Um, now, he does, you know, I agree, agree with you. He th- admits that they kind of broke the rules by giving the gobstopper back. And I understand where you're coming from and I don't deserve this. Another interesting thing, like you were talking about earlier, about scenes that people weren't prepared for. When uh, Gene Wilder originally read these lines with Grandpa Joe, uh, when he originally read them, he read them soft and quiet and relaxed. And then he goes off on And them. then during the actual free, you know, filming, he screams it at him. So again, genuine reaction. Yeah. Yeah. And then it turns out that Charlie wins. I thought that was a pretty nebulous test for him to leave the gobstopper and that's it. I mean, he could have just as easily, you know, just walked out the door. And to say that that was the test for Willy Wonka to get the gobstopper back? I th- well, well, he well because Willy Wonka says that you know, you can't show anybody, you can't tell anybody, you can you can have it, but you can't talk about it. And I think that uh Charlie felt that because he disobeyed the rules and he participated in the bubbles that, you know, he doesn't deserve it. And I think that showed Wonka 
that this kid is trustworthy. He's also unselfish. That so, was he was going for. And unselfish. And so I buy that as a test for sure. Mm-hmm. That's just me. I mean, he could have kept it and gotten $10,000 for his family. Or like you said, he, he knew he broke the rules and he wasn't thinking of himself. He was thinking that he hurt Willy Wonka. He wanted to give it back to him and show that he's unselfish. Here's a theory for you. He knows that that wasn't Slugworth. Yeah, Doesn't he at this point? Or is that afterwards? Well, he finds out after because after he wins, that's when Wilkerson comes in and reveals himself. Oh, okay. I was going to say that, well, he already knew that Wilkerson wasn't Slugworth, so he wasn't going to get Tangran. Mm-hmm. But. Okay, but the other kids supposedly make it out of the factory alive and they have their gobs. We never see them again. We'll never know. Now in the remake, they show the kids leaving the factory. In this one, we never see the kids or why, the parents leave. Why the factory. would you why would you even bring that up? The remake? Yeah, why would you do it? I don't know. Cuz he's cuz Johnny Depp's so dreamy. No. That's why you brought it up. No, no, I'm going to no. need more than that. Why would you bring up the remake? Charlie could just as easily be an upstanding person and keep the gobstopper for himself. He's not looking for a cash out necessarily at all. Oh no, he, no, 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 no. He gave it back because he felt bad. I yeah, think, yeah, I, I, agree I, I, know, that, I know that, but he could have just as easily kept it and kept his word of not sharing it with anybody. Yeah, he could have, but he didn't. But that wasn't the test that Willy Wonka set out. Well, I'm sure there would be more revealed if any of us chose to read the book. Yeah. <laughs> that's going to happen. However, <laughs> however, all we have to go with is what is on screen. That's right. I this agree. isn't a reading podcast. No, but I see what you're saying. You know, if, if it's easy to watch this film and not think of it in those terms and just think of it as this fun ride that the filmmakers wanted to take you on. You know, it's when you go into these, uh, the subtext of everything and people trying to pull these theories out and trying to make it more fun to talk about. Some of them are interesting for some movies and some of them aren't. And I mean, that's just, that's just the way the world works now. And we can expect that with any movie we see. And well, go one ahead. of the things I think with these theories is the first time you watch a movie, you don't need to have any of these theories. You can make a few of your own. You can have some ideas of your own, but Watching these movies the first time is just a fun ride. I think they enhance sometimes the rewatchability, like for Matrix and other movies. When you start looking at these theories and people, what people think on the internet and all that, and you start going looking for things of, could that work or is that not true? I mean, you know, you're discussing with me the opposite side of the coin of how a lot of these theories could be wrong. It's created that dialogue for us just by having these theories. Yeah, but you also said Matrix, so your credibility just went to the fucking tank. I like The Matrix. And I got to say that, you know, if it's not a musical, the only way John is going to like a movie is if you could have some sort of a theory angle to approach that storyline with. Sure. And I can't think of a movie that the theory makes it better for me. Did you hear the story behind the Willy Wonka wash? The, uh, oh, yeah. It was in the foam. Yeah, it was um, fire extinguisher foam. Right. And it Mixed made everybody else, yeah. and made everybody's skin irritated and Puffy. they all had medical attention. And mm-hmm. Yeah. Crazy shoot. But back in 19, probably 70 when they shot it because it was released in 71. Um, Nobody thought about did it. Did they have like. And it's all practical. Did they have like That's safety cool. people on sets back then? Why are you asking me? Well, I wasn't around back then. No, but you're a filmmaker. That doesn't mean I have safety people on set at all. We, oh, shit. I don't think I've ever had that. safety people. We know yeah. that from experience, right, Ken? Uh, pretty much. Have you? Have either of you ever gotten hurt on any of my sets? Yes. That we are I'm allowed. not talking emotionally. That we are allowed to talk about? No, you signed the NDA. Okay. All right. So Willy Wonka says, yeah, you win, and then go into this crazy elevator, and then they fly off to Never Never Land. Yeah. We don't know if they ever landed. Well, I guess we don't. There's a lot of things about this movie we'll never know. Mm -hmm. But I guess we can ask some people on the internet and they'll tell us. Yeah. Well, there was supposed to be a sequel because uh, Dahl wrote another book called Willy Wonka and the Glass Elevator. Uh, But he was so upset, apparently, by the changes that were made in this movie that he refused to sell the rights to the sequel book. Oh, well. So that's why we never got the sequel. I wonder who owns the rights now. I think he still does. 
Is he still alive? I don't know. He can't be. He wrote the... Probably not. He, he wrote, wrote the fucking Wizard of Oz. Well, he also wrote the uh, the Witches movie. That kid movie came out for kids a while back and was so upset. I mean, he, I guess he's very eccentric and hates when his movies are like made into... Or his visions are made into movies that he doesn't agree with the way they're done. That he drove outside different theaters with a megaphone yelling for people to not see the movie. That's a lot of effort. Yeah. That is a lot of effort. Yeah. For Willy Wonka, besides the script changes, he also wanted, he had a specific actor in mind to play Willy Wonka and was not happy with the casting of Gene Wilder. So who else did uh, the director want to play Willy Wonka? He really wanted Spike Mulligan. Who the like, fuck is Spike he Mulligan? He was an eccentric British actor. But again, they thought he just wasn't quite right for the role. And uh, the director really wanted Gene Wilder. Yeah, oh, well. Those were your big top A-listers. Now, I, I guess, guess Peter Sellers was also considered for it. Oh, interesting. That from, would have been wasn't interesting. Wasn't he uh, from Pink Panther? Yeah. yeah. He was from Pink he Panther. Is considered Inspector Clouseau. He, yeah. he wanted it. Did he? Yeah. Yeah. But uh, I don't think anybody else wait. could have done the role. Wait, wait, wait. You, you found it. There's a couple other names in there. Who was the other names? Like I said, <laughs> I didn't write it down. So oh, you didn't sense. do your research? Is that what you're saying? It's your movie that you fucking love so much. I knew that we were going to have uh, factoids out the yin yang. Yeah, what now, bitch? What do you got to say? At least I pulled Spike Mulligan out of Don's ass. Well, he, uh, first of all, you were nowhere near my ass. And second of all, who the fuck is Spike Mulligan's? I don't You have to look that up. Oh, all right. Shit. Did you like the ending flying off in the elevator? It didn't bother me one way or the other. It was fine. One of the more... Uh, things to kind of look at and ask about this is originally the movie was supposed to end with Charlie saying yippee Wait, after he I, finds out he won the factory. It wasn't grandpa. No, that wasn't, that was written at the last minute uh, because the director and the producer didn't want it to end with yippee. They wanted to end, you know, cause they didn't want to pull a star Wars moment. They wanted to pull out a something else. So that's why Gene Wilder came up with the line of, do you know what happened to the guy who wanted every, or the guy who got everything he wanted? He died happy. He lived happily, happily ever, ever after. after. Lived happily after. It's your fucking movie, and you don't even know the quotes. Yeah, whatever. He, uh, Gene Wilder came up with that line. So, what do you think? Should we rate this bitch? Let's rate this bitch. Hey, professor, how do we rate our movies? We give it a one to five scale rating. A five is a movie that you're turning around right now and watching it again. It just finished, and you're going to watch it again immediately. A one is a movie that you have said to yourself, I have seen it, and I'm never going to watch it again. A three is somewhere in between. You feel okay about it, and you're going to watch it again. Maybe even own the movie. And what would a zero be? A zero is a movie that you feel like that, you are owed two hours of your life back. Or wait, how long was this? Wait. Hour and 43 minutes. Or like an hour and 43 minutes back of your life. I feel like we should kind of reword our ratings there. Like a zero should be candy corn. Maybe a one, black licorice. Wait. What would a three be? Candy corn? Do you like candy corn? I hate candy corn. I like candy corn. Oh my Why God. does that not surprise me in the least? What okay, would, I, have, I have an idea. I have an idea. Why don't you shut the fuck up and you go ahead and give us your rating. This movie was definitely a movie that I had grown up on and it had been a long time since I'd seen it. The, uh, the musical numbers in it are okay. The, the movie uh, is always first and foremost thought of in my mind with the Oompa Loompas and the Oompa Loompa song. For the most part, it's a passable watch it is not something that I am excited to watch again anytime soon. It is certainly 50 years old. It, it feels old. Gene Wilder does a great job with this, and I think that it's an iconic Gene Wilder role. And I do appreciate Charlie as well. The relationship that he has with his grandfather is also very sweet, but it's still not enough to make me say, I'm ready to watch that again. And so I'm going to give this movie a 1.5. 1.5 from the professor. Oh, did you think that was? Do you think that was higher than what he was going to do? No, I thought actually you could go a little bit higher. But. Oh, interesting. Uh, you want to go, or would you like me to go? I can go. 
Okay. Uh, didn't I tell you to shut the fuck up? <laughs> and didn't I call you an asshole? Yeah, you did. Go ahead, my <laughs> friend. Hit us. So, sorry, Don's dad, for Don's behavior this podcast. He's been a little bit out of control. I think he's had a little too much candy today. <laughs> is that, well is well that played. What it is? <laughs> yes, I've had a lot of fucking candy and I fucking love it. It's because you have all that leftover Halloween candy. Yeah, well, I mean. You've been stealing from your kids again, haven't you? I, I don't call it stealing. I call it procuring. Or rent. Anyway, right. I know on. you don't want to hear it, but should I go into my rating? Yeah, hit us. Okay. Anyway, uh, kind of opposite of what you were saying, Professor, I actually enjoy the music in this. Big surprise. Uh, there are a few songs here and there that are annoying, but you know, I like the Cheer Up Charlie song. I like the Pure Imagination. I'm not completely you know, done by that. The Oompa Loompa songs get a little old, uh, but Gene Wilder just nails it out of the park for me when it comes to this movie when it comes to rewatchability, this is where i stumble a bit um while i was looking forward to seeing it again you know from start to finish because usually i only catch parts of it here and there on tv when it replays um i really did want to see the whole movie from beginning to end and again like i said i like looking up these internet theories and this conspiracy theories and things like that, and looking for little things i like reading about the trivia you know about so and so cuts their knee or here's where the kid gets smacked in the face or you know here's some other thing you know just interesting facts the chocolate river just i i like the rewatchability in that now when it comes to wanting to watch this movie again I'm not going to run out and actively want to see the whole thing again. If I catch it on TV or someone suggests, hey, let's watch Willy Wonka, you know, I, I'm leaning more towards I might watch parts of it, but I don't want to watch the whole thing. Now, usually when I give my ratings and I say I could take it or leave it, I'd go halfway with a 2.5. Uh, but because I'm not eager to run out and watch the whole thing from start to finish again, but just parts, I'm going to have to knock my rating down to about a 2.0. 2.0. So, 1.5, 2.0. So if you were to surf into this on the television, do you watch it to the end? I don't know if I watch it to the end. I'm not a big fan of the ending, especially because, you know, when that elevator takes off and goes to the building, you can kind of see the string that they're pulling it along and floating around. And it's a little bit hokey to me. I would probably watch it up to the point where Gene Wilder, you know, says, Charlie, you won, you won. And then just turn it off there. I totally would have thought that you would watch it up through the next musical piece. No. Yes, he would. Hey, Don, has Elise seen this movie? Uh, I don't know. I think the I think she saw that shitty remake. So no. so probably not. No, I, would, I don't think she I, has. I would be curious to know what she thinks of this movie, only because under your tutelage, she has a serious appreciation for the art of a movie. I don't know. I asked her if she wanted to watch it with me, and she said no. Uh, of course, for the past four weeks, I've been saying, hey, Elise. You want to watch Texas Chainsaw Massacre with me? <laughs> no. Hey, Elise, want to watch Nightmare on Elm Street with me? No. Weren't you so. the one who, when I brought the Freddy glove, you put the Freddy glove on and chased your daughter around the kitchen? I remember that there was a lot of screaming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, I fucking love that glove, dude. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. That's the only reason why I keep you around. All right, so... Don, your rating. Yes, my rating. Uh, Willie Walker and the Chocolate Factory. Uh, timeless movie. Uh, like I said, I really enjoyed the family element of it. I really enjoyed uh, Gene Wilder. Uh, the sets were beautiful. Uh, it's impressive that it was uh, all practical. Uh, it's mind-blowing that it cost $3 million to make in 1971 and only made $4.1 4.5 million uh in the theater but obviously becoming a a classic on video and, and a classic musical and i like wilder's performance and the songs i could take or leave in 1971 musicals were you know just kind of musicals you had mary yeah you, know, you had mary poppins and you had the wizard of oz and obviously these were earlier but this this movie was in the same vein as those and i enjoy mary poppins and i enjoy the wizard of oz and i enjoy willy wonka am i in a hurry to go out and watch it probably not uh will i watch it again eh, maybe eventually it is a, is it a zero to me 100 percent no so i'm going to give willy wonka and the chocolate factory a 2.5 right there in the middle so you get a 2.5 from me, a 
1.5 from the professor and a 2.0 from John. Yep. Uh, since in honor of our, uh, you know, our horror series that we did, we had one specific question we asked every time we watched the movies, which was, what was your favorite kill in this movie? Favorite kill in here. Not Augustus Gloop. I think Veruca. Veruca. She was the one who deserved to get it the most. She just dropped down a hole. She just dropped down a hole. With, with a, a musical with, number. With with a label of bad egg. Yeah. Uh, I would have to say mine would be Mike TV. or uh, What's his name? Mike, Mike TV. Mike, Mike TV. TV. Uh, because when he's little and he's put in the purse, Willie or... Wonka takes the purse from the mom, and if you notice, he keeps swinging it in really big motions. To he's probably you know uh, killing the kid inside the purse. So I'm going to go with the TV one. Well, I love in that scene too uh, when the Oompa Loompa tugs at him and he bends over and he says, "No, I'm, I won't hold you responsible." Yeah, like yeah, something's yeah. going to happen. Oh, is that it? Was the taffy puller? Yeah, the taffy. That, that's puller. what. Yeah. So. So. What's that, yours? That I, I think I'm going to have to go with the bad egg as well. Uh, I just, that whole music number, then just getting rid of her because she was the most annoying character. Yeah, but there was nothing to it. I guess I guess if you look at him, Augustus just falls in and drowns. Ver- uh, Violet eats the gum, and that's where something physically happens to her, and it looks dangerous. You know what Same with Mike. You know what might have made that scene better with Violet? Blood. Is, do you remember the scene from Cloverfield where the lady gets stung and then blows up and explodes? Yeah. That's how I imagined when they closed that door and she went around the rolled around the corner. That's what I imagined happening. She just exploding. Yeah, just inflates and explodes. Yeah. yeah. All right. So there you have it. Our favorite kills. Now comes the time in our podcast where we're going to select our next film just to catch everybody up. Uh, we put, we selected six genres out of our Bronco helmet and each of us put one movie for said genre in our Bronco helmet and we've been pulling them out ever since. Uh, we took the month of October off to give you some horror series, but now we're back with only two movies left in the Bronco helmet. And as we've stated before, once these two are picked and done, we will then be putting our fan picks in the Bronco helmet and going from there. So if you are listening and you want a movie... Uh, for us to talk about make a suggestion let us know what you want us to review and talk about and we'll fucking do it because we, we will like that yeah there's still time to get some suggestions in there for our next round of picks wait oh well, there's plenty of time we, we will so if somebody says matrix reloaded we will <laughs> <laughs> we will selectively review the movies <laughs> You should see the glare, the daggers. He's he's kind of looking at Professor like Willy Wonka looked at those kids. And the next movie we will be reviewing here at Three Guys in a Flick. It's genre first. No, it's a buddy movie. How do you know? Could it be Don's movie? I think Don's, yours is a Western. Mine is a Western, John. Thanks for reminding me. Uh, yes, this in fact is a buddy film. See? And it goes by the name of Hot Fuzz. Ooh, I just thought for sure it was going to be Lethal Weapon. So did I, actually. I'm kind of shocked that it wasn't Lethal Weapon. Same See, vein, I suppose. So I thought you were going to do Lethal Weapon. So is that why you didn't do Lethal Weapon? Yeah, well, joke's on us. Now we don't... Hey, someone out there, put in Lethal Weapon in the hat or in the comments. Or in the suggestion. That's what I meant to say. Hey, somebody out there, put Lethal Weapon in the suggestion. Or better yet, put Lethal Weapon 2. John or doesn't. John even doesn't, better yet, put in a musical. I, uh, musicals are here now banned from Three Guys in a Flick. So if you want a musical, I'm sorry, we're not going to do it. I'll get it in. Uh, no, you won't. Because you're not very good at that. So what I hear. So join us next week when we review Edgar Wright's Cop Tale with Simon Pegg and Nick Frost, Hot Fuzz. Hey, John, where can they find us? They can find us at any popular or unpopular podcasting hosting site, Spotify, Podbeam, uh, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio. We are on all of them uh, because cause I've thrown us out everywhere. Uh, they can find us at our website, threeguysinaflick.com. They can also find us on Instagram and with Don singing today, maybe TikTok. 
All right, so chances are that's going to get cut, but we'll see what happens. For Three Guys in a Flick, I'm Don. I'm John. And I'm Ken. Thanks for listening. Uh, so, uh, Professor, uh, your wife being the biggest Johnny Depp fan that we know, do you think she would prefer this one over the original? Hands down, she would totally pick Charlie over Willie. Absolutely. Yeah. <sighs> but he's so creepy and pedophile and he just, oh my God, how could she like that? I don't know. That's just who she is. You just got to settle down and go for the ride. I think <laughs> that's what she wants. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I think that Johnny Roll's best role ever is Glenn in A Nightmare on Elm Street, and his best scene ever is when he's getting sucked through the bed. A close second to Once Upon a Time in Mexico, which you both disliked, by the way. I'm not that excited that you put, you know, the term Johnny Depp with sucking. It just, I don't know where you're going with that. And it, hands down, it does not beat Johnny Mnemonic. Well, that's because that's Keanu, Keanu Reeves. Reeves. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fuck off. Good night. <laughs>